Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Firstly, thank you for all of the lovely and supportive messages in the comment section of last week's video. I'm especially grateful for how kind people were about me asking for help with reaching 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. With that in mind, thank you to the new subscribers. It's lovely to have you aboard. But I also want to thank everyone who was already subscribed, but who commented encouraging things. I'm aware of just how lucky I am to have you all as my community, not least because I have seen what the rest of the internet can be like. In all seriousness, I am so thankful for this oasis of history love. And I'm, I'm going to stop there before I start crying. <clears throat> Welcome to December. It's the first Friday of the month, which means that it's time for us to take a look at the history news headlines from last month. As always, I'll be using my description box to link the history news articles we'll be looking at today, in addition to any other relevant materials. There are some updates and there's also some new news. If you want to refresh your memory on any of the previous History News Roundup videos, then you can check out the linked playlist, which this video will also be added to. Now, we've got a lot to cover. So, let's jump right in. Updates first, and full disclosure, I'm feeling a bit spicy and very soapboxy today, so that's probably going to be fairly apparent for the next few minutes. We're starting with the contested future of the Parthenon marbles, which are currently on display in the British Museum. A few months ago, in March, I believe, I reported that Prime Minister Boris Johnson had asserted that, quote, the UK government has a firm, long-standing position on the sculptures, which is that they were legally acquired by Lord Elgin under the appropriate laws of the time and have been legally owned by the British Museum's trustees since their acquisition. Now, it seems, there has been a U-turn in his assessment of the situation because he is now positioning it as a matter for the trustees of the British Museum to decide upon, he claimed that, quote, the British Museum operates independently of the government. It is free, rightly, from political interference. Any question about the location for the Parthenon sculptures is a matter for them. The current chair of trustees for the museum is the former Conservative Chancellor, George Osborne. Additionally, the British Museum, like a number of other national museums in the UK, is funded by the government, by DCMS, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. Now, I'm not going to name my sources, but I have been told that, allegedly, museums receiving government funds have been threatened with those funds being reduced if they do not toe the line in regard to their collection items and exhibitions. I don't know if Mr Johnson is being deliberately deceitful with his statement or if parts of his government just have oversight that he is completely unaware of. Adding to the confusion in this regard is the fact that the British Museum trustees do not seem to have the legal right to do what Mr Johnson is claiming. The British Museum is bound by legislation that provides that, quote, objects vested in the trustees as part of the collections of the museum shall not be disposed of by them. As CAPEX points out, there are limited exceptions to this, namely that, quote, they can dispose of duplicate items, certain objects made after 1850, objects which are unfit to be kept, objects which have become useless due to damage or deterioration, and they can transfer objects to certain other national museums, such as the National Gallery and the V&A. CAPEX also points to a test case from 2005 that might have given the trustees some wiggle room, however. 
because there was a High Court case that centred around the heirs of a Czech lawyer who was seeking to recover four old master drawings which had been stolen by the Nazis in 1939 and had eventually ended up in the British Museum's collection. As the British Museum is also a charity, they attempted to argue that forcing them to keep work that had been looted by the Nazis away from the rightful owner was immoral. And as charities are meant to be institutions for the benefit of society, forcing them to behave immorally was not quite the done thing. As it was, the High Court in this case ruled that the Act of Parliament, which prevented them from making disposals of collection items, was the thing that had to be adhered to. The judge in this case found that the only way around it was for Parliament to intervene by producing a new act or some other statutory procedure. So, the British Museum, holding on to the Parthenon sculptures, or for that matter, the Benin bronzes, on which more in a moment, is seemingly not the decision of the trustees of the museum. Rather, it's up to the government to intervene. I do find it interesting that with all of the fingers being pointed at the British Museum at the moment, none of the trustees are pointing out that the choice is not in their hands, and they're not even doing this anonymously. But perhaps that makes sense. I mean, they are probably worried about having their funding cut, aren't they? Allegedly. While the British Museum seems to be in a bit of a stalemate when it comes to the return of many, if not all, of its contested holdings, the same is not true elsewhere. Many thanks to Hunessy Hawkins on Twitter for sending me the link to this New York Times article, which reports that the head of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African Art has announced that museum officials have removed its Benin bronzes from display and plan to begin the process of potentially repatriating the artefacts. The museum's director is quoted as saying, I can confirm that we have taken down the Benin bronzes we had on display and we are fully committed to repatriation where it is warranted. We cannot build for the future without making our best effort at healing the wounds of the past. If this repatriation does take place, the artefacts will, presumably, be displayed in the Edo Museum of West African Art, if, of course, enough money is raised to complete that museum, which is planned to be built in Benin City. It's hoped that it will be finished as early as 2026. However, as Cassie Packard, writing for Hyperallergic, points out, quote, but declaring plans to repatriate does not make it so. Beyond the provenance research that has already been executed, steps along the way to full repatriation include appraisal and valuation by external experts. Conversations with the party on the receiving end. Here, Nigeria which is aware that the museum has Benin bronzes, but has not officially requested their return. And green lights from the Smithsonian Secretary and the Smithsonian Board of Regents. Then the museum, quote, will consider returning artefacts to their original home if requested, end quote. According to Artnet, the National Museum of African Art has 43 Benin bronzes in total in its collection. In addition to the 16 artefacts that have been earmarked for potential restitution, 23 objects have unclear provenance and are currently undergoing further research. I will, of course, keep you all updated as the Smithsonian's plans become clearer. A repatriation ceremony for some other Benin bronzes did take place last month in New York. Officials from the Metropolitan Museum of Art returned three artefacts to their counterparts from the Nigerian National Commission for Museums and Monuments, the NCMM. The artefacts in question were two 16th century brass plaques looted from the court of Benin and a brass head, produced in the region of Ife around the 14th century. 
these items are also intended to be displayed in the Edo Museum of West African Art in Benin City when it is completed. This next history news headline was shared with me by Verity Banks on Twitter, so many thanks to Verity, because there has been another repatriation ceremony for Benin bronzes, this one in Paris, France. 26 artefacts were handed over to representatives from Benin on this occasion. President Macron commissioned a report in 2018 that ended up recommending that French museums return the works that had been found to have been stolen. So, in 2020, the French Parliament acted accordingly and passed a law that allowed the country to hand over the artworks to Benin and another former French colony, Senegal. Benin's president, Patrice Talon, said he felt, quote, an overwhelming emotion while receiving the objects. He also added, you'll agree with me that the restitution of 26 artworks we are celebrating today is only a step in the ambitious process of equity and of restitution of heritage, extorted from the territory of the Benin Kingdom by France. These 26 artefacts represent a small percentage of the 5,000 items that Benin is demanding back from France. So this repatriation is therefore the beginning of the story. And it's a story which we will follow. Our last update is about the auction of Marie Antoinette's diamond bracelets through Christie's Auction House in Switzerland. It was estimated that this pair of bracelets would fetch between two million and four million dollars. Can we just take a minute to look at this picture from Reuters of these bracelets actually being worn? I mean, It looks like the diamonds are all at least a centimetre in diameter. Somehow, seeing the bracelets being worn on the wrist just really brings home how opulent these pieces are. At least it does for me. Now, last month's auction was the first time that these bracelets that are made up of 112 cut diamonds had ever gone under the hammer. The lot went to an anonymous telephone bidder for far more than expected because the bracelet sold for 7,459,000 Swiss francs, which is more than $8 million or £5.8 million. I do wonder if or when we will ever see these bracelets again, but rest assured, if they do ever appear, I will certainly be letting you all know. Now it's time to look at the new news. The first new history news headline stays in the auction house because last month also saw the sale of a large sapphire and diamond brooch with matching ear clips. These items had once belonged to the Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna. She was the aunt of the last Emperor of Russia, Tsar Nicholas II. This particular auction lot was originally among some 244 pieces of jewellery that were smuggled out of Russia in, quote, two shabby Gladstone bags at the time of the Russian Revolution in 1917. Another piece in this smuggled collection of 244 bits of jewellery was the so-called Vladimir Tiara that was purchased by Queen Mary in 1921 for £28,000 and which now belongs to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The brooch and ear clips, however, were sold by an unidentified European royal family and they were expected to fetch up to £400,000. They actually sold, again to an anonymous telephone bidder, for 806,500 Swiss francs, which works out at nearly $900,000 or just over £650,000. So, once again, that's considerably more than the original estimate. 
Next up, we have a report of the discovery of an item that is being referred to by some publications as a, quote, small gold Bible. This find was made by metal detectorist and NHS nurse Buffy Bailey from Lancaster. And she made the find while she was searching in farmland near York. The gold item is half an inch long, weighs five grams, is 22 or 24 karat gold. It's thought to date to the 15th century and it is engraved with images of St. Leonard and St. Margaret. As these are patron saints for childbirth, it's thought that the artefact could have been an object that was used for protection during either pregnancy and or childbirth. Additionally, as the item was found on land that is near to property that was once owned by King Richard III, it's also being speculated that this piece could have been owned by a female relative of his, or even by his wife, Anne Neville. Now, this is a remarkable find, but it may not quite be what it is being described as. I recommend reading Kathleen Kennedy's full article for Hyperallergic, where she explores a number of the claims that have been made about this object. The first one she looks into is the notion that it's a Bible, or that it was intended to represent a Bible. To my mind, Kennedy compellingly points out that the saints depicted, Leonard and Margaret, don't appear in the Bible but they do appear in prayer books like Books of Hours. Rather than this being a Bible, Kennedy argues that this object is instead intended to represent a prayer book or a Book of Hours. Regardless, this is a beautiful find, and it is currently being assessed at the Yorkshire Museum. Once a valuation has been set, it's entirely possible that that museum may decide to purchase it and put it on display. If and or when this item is set to be put on public display, rest assured I will be sure to update you with any dates and or booking information. The next history news headline is the one that I am the most excited about. In 2019, an auction item that was catalogued as an antique carved wooden bird sold for £75. Paul Fitzsimmons was the buyer in that case. After cleaning and restoration, it was found to be a painted and gilded oak carving of a falcon, wearing an imperial crown, holding a scepter, and surrounded by red and white roses. This is the heraldic badge of Anne Boleyn, and it's thought to have once adorned her private apartments at Hampton Court Palace. It is believed to be worth £200,000. When Fitzsimmons first bought the piece, it was quite blackened, possibly with soot, so it's been suggested that this may have been mounted above a fireplace. The absolutely wonderful Tracy Borman mentions this discovery in her fabulous new book, Crown and Scepter, which explores the history of the British crown from William the Conqueror to Elizabeth II, and which was published last month. Thrillingly, the owner of the piece, Paul Fitzsimmons, has offered to lend the Falcon to Hampton Court Palace so that it can go on display there. As of making this video, I haven't found out when this might happen or for how long, but rest assured, I will absolutely be keeping my eye out for any development so that I can update you and also plan my own visit. Additionally, if you would like any more information on the heraldic badges and devices of Henry VIII's six wives, then you can have a look at the video I made on that topic, which I will leave linked. A collection of painted portrait panels, thought to date to the Elizabethan period, have been found during restoration work at the Star Pub in Hoddesdon, Hertfordshire. The building is thought to date back to at least the medieval period, and it may once have been a medieval open hall. In 1580, the building was purchased by William Cecil, Lord Burley, who was, of course, Elizabeth's chief advisor. Five of these discovered paintings depict half figures in trilobed frames, with biblical texts in the associated spandrels. 
The figures alternate male and female, with one of the females holding a lapdog. Possible subjects for the works that have been suggested but not confirmed include William Cecil himself, members of his family and or household, and potentially Queen Elizabeth I. However, the expert jury is yet to formally confirm or deny any of these identifications for now. In addition to exhibiting a high level of technique, this portrait series also contains fascinating depictions of Elizabethan clothing and millinery, making it a really useful source for fashion historians going forward. On the wall, there is another panel which contains black decorative drawing which has been found to date to an earlier period than the portraits. Conservators have been working on this building since 2014 and these artworks are protected by a glass and timber screen and there are plans in place to inspect the works regularly going forward to ensure that they do not deteriorate and of course to remedy anything that might jeopardise their ongoing survival. But these are not the only Tudor wall paintings whose discovery made the news last month because restorers working on Calverley Old Hall, which is a manor house in Yorkshire in England, have uncovered three walls of floor-to-ceiling artwork that's thought to date from sometime between 1540 and 1580. The wall paintings in question feature swirls, birds with teeth and tiny men in hats and they were all found behind wall plaster that was being removed during restoration efforts. The work that's been found is described as being red, white and black paintings that were typical of the grotesque style, which is an Italian style fashioned after a royal palace of the Roman Emperor Nero. Both the walls with the paintings and the manor house they were found in are currently being restored by the Landmark Trust Conservation Charity, and that means that these ongoing works are only possible with help from public donation. So I'm going to leave a link to that charity in my description box in case anyone would like to find out a bit more about the Landmark Trust and or if you would maybe like to support their work. Next up, we have the report of a find that has researchers scratching their heads. Archaeologists in Newfoundland dug up a rare two-penny piece that was minted more than 520 years ago, between 1493 and 1499, which was during the reign of King Henry VII. So the questions are, how did it get there and when? There appears to be principally two schools of thought on this. One is that it was lost by John Guy or by one of his settlers who accompanied him to Cooper's Cove, as it was then known, and that would have been after 1610. So this would require somebody to be carrying, dropping and losing a coin that was over a century old, which in itself is absolutely not impossible. The other suggestion is that John Cabot came into possession of the coin following his arrival in England in 1495 and that the coin went with him on his voyage, which hoped to find a shorter trading route to Asia. Cabot landed on Newfoundland in 1497, so perhaps he, or maybe even a member of his crew, are the ones that lost the coin at that time. David Kindy, writing for Smithsonian Mag, explains that, quote, Analysis of the coin is ongoing, but researchers hope to display it at the Cupid's Cove historical site in time for the 2022 tourist season. I certainly look forward to seeing the results of this analysis and finding out just what the researchers have been able to discover. The next headline was actually one that I missed from October, but I wanted to bring it up today because I am really interested to read your thoughts on this one. On the 21st of October, the largest known Triceratops specimen was auctioned in Paris and it was bought by a private buyer for the equivalent of £5.6 million. The specimen is known as Big John on account of it being an 8 metre long skeleton. 
The Natural History Museum's article makes it clear that this specimen, quote, was legally excavated from a site in South Dakota, and the sale is all above board. Nevertheless, scientists are concerned that sales like this are depriving the world of valuable information about these ancient animals. But also, can we just take a moment to imagine the scene? So you've made a new friend, perhaps even a potential romantic partner, and you get invited to their house for the first time, and when you get there, you find that they've got an eight metre long triceratops skeleton in their lounge, or, I don't know, maybe even their bedroom. Where do private collectors keep the stuff that usually goes in a museum? Just, just imagine you find that site. What do you think? How, how would you respond? Do let me know in the comments. We're staying with massive dinosaurs for the next headline too. A new study that has reconsidered some fossils may have discovered a new dinosaur that has been given the name Supersaurus. Supersaurus is believed to have lived about 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period, and it also seems that it may have more than earned its name, as it is thought to have measured more than 40 metres from snout to tail which the Independent reminds us is, quote, about the length of five London buses. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if a full Supersaurus skeleton was ever located, that that probably isn't going to be auctioned into a private collection. But maybe I'm just lacking imagination, and there is a buyer out there with both the space and the inclination. But as yet, I don't believe there has been the discovery of a full skeleton. And also, these findings do still need to go through peer review, as they were first presented online this month at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology's annual conference. If the results of this study are validated, it would make the Supersaurus longer than any other known dinosaur. So let's hope this peer review is nice and speedy so we can see if this find is actually confirmed. The next headline shows what can happen when a finding is reviewed, because occasionally it might cost someone a fair bit of money. CNN reported that the so-called Golf Salvatore Mundi, which sold for $450 million at a Christie's auction house as a fully authenticated Leonardo da Vinci, has now been downgraded by curators at the Prado National Museum in Madrid, Spain. The Prado has chosen not to list this painting under the heading by Leonardo, but instead has placed it under attributed works, workshop, or authorised and supervised by Leonardo. It has not been explicitly stated just how much this new downgraded attribution may knock off the price that the Saudi culture minister bought this piece for in November 2017, apparently intending it for the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. But I can't see how this won't affect the value of the piece negatively. Now, if you like your art auctions with a side of heavy domestic drama, then this next headline is for you, because an acrimonious divorce has resulted in the most valuable auction ever to be held by one of the world's leading art houses. The Maclow collection was amassed over more than half a century by the real estate magnate Henry Maclow and his then wife, Linda Maclow, who is also an honorary trustee of New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. The collection included works by Andy Warhol, Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. When no agreement could be reached by either party over the value of the art collection during their divorce, the judge in the case found it necessary to test the market and so ordered that the works be sold. The collection of 35 works was duly sold by Sotheby's and it fetched more than $676 million, or £503 million, making it the most valuable auction ever to be held. But that's not all, because there are a further 40 works in this couple's collection yet to be auctioned, and that auction 
is scheduled for May 2022. And I couldn't find it specified anywhere what will be in this second round of auctioning. So I will certainly be interested to see just what gets sold in May and how much that collection is going to fetch. But I did mention a side of drama and so I will deliver because The Guardian reports that there are barbs that are still being exchanged between these former spouses who are, by the way, both in their 80s. Harry has since got remarried to Patricia Landau and dear Harry chose to celebrate his nuptials by apparently posting 42 foot high images of the newlyweds on one of his buildings in New York's Park Avenue. And that building is within sight of his ex-wife's apartment. That's a big yikes from me. Archaeologists have discovered the world's oldest jewellery in a cave in the western Morocco desert. And although the find was reported last month, the 33 beads, all made from half-inch long sea snail shells, were uncovered during excavations conducted between 2014 and 2018. Stephen L. Coombe, a professor of anthropology in the University of Arizona, explains that, quote, the beads were probably part of the way people express their identity with clothing. They're the tip of the iceberg for that kind of human trait. They show that it was present even hundreds of thousands of years ago and that humans were interested in communicating to bigger groups of people than their immediate friends and family. We don't know what they meant, but they're clearly symbolic objects that were deployed in a way that other people could see them. Sarah Cascun, writing for Artnet, points out that, quote, each bead had a hole drilled through it, presumably so the ornaments could be hung on strings or clothing, possibly worn as earrings or a necklace. Many have smoothed, polished edges, suggesting the intentional work of a craftsperson. They are similar to other finds on the African continent, but the earliest examples had previously been just 130,000 years old. But these Moroccan finds, in contrast, have been dated from between 142,000 to 150,000 years ago. Last, but by no means least, we have this report about another incredibly old, although not as old, piece of jewellery. In this case, a 41,500-year-old ivory pendant that may be the oldest human-decorated jewellery in Eurasia. It was discovered by archaeologists working in Poland, and this pendant that's now in two pieces is made of mammoth ivory and it's decorated with puncture marks. The team that made the find believe that these more than 50 puncture marks that's found on the pendant could each represent a successful animal hunt or perhaps cycles of the moon or sun. Tantalisingly, an awl, which is a tool used for piercing objects, was found near the remains of this pendant, and it has been found to date to around the same time. The lead researcher, Sara Talamo, who is a chemistry professor at the University of Bologna in Italy, told Life Science, quote, At the moment, we cannot say much. We do not know what kind of change they face that made Homo sapiens shape such a wonderful object. The pendant and all were originally uncovered in 2010, but they are newly described. Additionally, research into these artefacts is still ongoing. But what do you think of any or all of the headlines we've looked at today? Were there any headlines that caught your eye in November that I didn't discuss in this video? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can find me on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box, and you can follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you did, why not share it with some friends? Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up and please subscribe to the channel. Let's see if we can hit 
100,000 subscribers before 2022. Also, if you hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down, YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.